Chairman of the Environmental Committee of the Florida Groundwater Association, also the Technical Committee Co-Chair for Florida Brownfields Association, and I'd like to welcome and thank you for coming to the panel discussion this morning. Um, our guests this morning are Natasha Lampkin, PRP Administrator, Matt Ingham, and James Treadwell, Professional Engineers with the DEP PRP Program. Get the slides going here. On our discussion outline today, Natasha will be talking about PRP status, update, and overview. Uh, and Matt and James are going to talk about natural attenuation monitoring and when to return to active remediation. And we look forward to that presentation. On behalf of the environmental industry, the entire industry, all practitioners and stakeholders, from agency term contractors to all the various subcontractors and vendors in this program, we hope to come to some improvements for efficiency today in the PRP, and uh, we look forward to hearing from the department on that topic. Um, we want to emphasize the question and answer session period um, while still giving DEP plenty of time to make sure that they have an opportunity to present everything that, Natasha, I know you have planned to share with the audience today. So I'll try to be brief, but I have some introductory comments to go through some recent history, which pretty much tells the story that's on everybody's mind, I believe, in the audience today. And there's no laser on here, but you can clearly see things were working quite well up until the pandemic. And then you see the August, uh, September 2020 pause that um, we're all too familiar with. And then somewhat of a recovery, uh, thanks to some work I'm gonna discuss here uh, through a lot of association leadership and an industry legislative response. Um, and then what stands out, of course, is the slug of purchase orders released in uh, July, end of June, um, and then the first quarter a lot of those numbers are due to net encumbrances that uh, I'm sure Natasha will go over first quarter um, data. Is the dashboard report out yet for October? Not. not yet? Okay. Um, well, August of 2020 was not only the time of the pause, but it was also a very significant point in my life. And I want to take a moment to thank Daniel. This is Daniel Ray French. And I am grateful to him because he is the donor, um, and he is right here. I had a heart transplant in August of 2020, about the same time the Revenue Estimating Conference was preparing to announce their basis for the pause. So I woke from a heart transplant to find the program in a pause. But thanks to the energy of a 31-year-old heart, now 33, and a clean bill of health, um, we've been able to rally uh, industry and form together uh, through our associations, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But after waking up and realizing we were in pause, we had a mountain to climb. And actually, that's me, if you see in that little clearing in the top. <laughs> um, 90 days after getting discharged from the hospital, uh, climbed this mountain to pow a power of the miracles of modern medicine to go from essentially dying from heart failure to heart transplant to 90 days later climbing an 1100 foot vertical hike. Um, it's metaphorical, I present this to you because it's symbolic of the journey that we've been on and the journey we're about to take again. Um, so basically with the energy of a 33 year old heart, we went to work. We formed a coalition, informal coalition of environmental associations in September of 2020, and we contacted our friends on the Hill, and we produced exceptional white papers and documents and statements. Um, these are not uh, provided to you to read. I'm just going to click through several of the documents just to show you the number of meetings that we had and the quality of documents we presented to legislators in order to get the funding back restored for this program. We had a tremendous response from the legislature in both 2021 and 2022 legislative session to the tune of $198 million of FCO appropriation, meaning these are the legislative appropriations that are in the budget for this, coming, for this current 
fiscal year. Nearly $200 million um, ready for not just purchase orders, but we are hoping to see the expenditures in the program rise to meet the level of appropriations so that we can communicate when session starts in March that the industry is responding to what the legislature has appropriated. And that's really the primary point of focus for today. That's the emphasis for the industry. And when we got this type of response from the legislature, this is the feeling of victory. This is the feeling of recovery. This is the feeling of not only being restored back to life with, vi you know, with vitalized energy through a heart transplant, but this is the feeling that we felt after getting the legislative response with the type of appropriations that were provided to restore this program to protect environmental quality in the state of Florida, keep our groundwater clean. But then we faced materials, inflation, labor issues, but then we put our act together and got documents and data and we were able to obtain the 15% surcharge that was applied last May, the 5% plus the 10% uh, surcharge for restoration. So we felt, again, feeling of victory. But then inflation continued and it only got worse. So we developed letters, suggestions, meetings. We met nearly quarterly with the department through associations. And we provided letters and suggestions and outlines for efficiency. And the DEP responded. We received a utility guidance document to help with the process of securing, securing utility power drops on remedial construction sites. Um, we asked for this guidance document Tim Barr and Natasha and their team put this together for us within weeks of our May 27th meeting in 2022. Actually, it was June 13th meeting, May 27th letter. This letter produced this response, and we also asked for improvement in natural attenuation monitoring. And we have Matt and James here to talk about that today. I want you all to realize something. And it's written in the is issue of the Florida Specifier on page 12. This article, please read page 12 of the October issue. John Waterman's desk at the Specifier has it. Page 12, it says, join environmental associations to make a difference. We are going to need you as we go forward to make sure that the petroleum restoration program is properly administered so we are good stewards of the groundwater in this state both as an industry working in concert with the Department of Environmental Protection and our legislators to get this right for the future of groundwater protection in Florida. So there are several associations that provide um, an opportunity for your involvement and Florida Groundwater Association, Environmental Professionals of Florida, Florida Brownfields Association, Florida Association of Professional Geologists, Florida Engineering Society. Take your pick, check them out, get involved. But you will receive information, inside information, as a member of these associations. And we can do the department a favor by receiving your questions, consolidating them, and then asking them instead of the department responding to these questions individually. Please get involved with your association of choice. Okay, well this slide I think Natasha will probably go over, but this is the net encumbrance here to date. Um, we are headed for record surplus at the end of this year if remedial construction projects are not approved in quantity. Um, we need to see the expenditures come up to match the purchase orders that have been issued. We need to see efficiencies in the program um, to be able to essentially um, release a lot of the emergency brakes that are on a lot of these projects. There is uh, going to be a question answer session. I would like to hear 
the line up at the podium to ask questions at the end of the DEP presentation so we can hear directly from you. Um, we need data to justify another surcharge if we're going to approach the department with that again this year. So inflationary data, um, the last year's surplus was based on September 2021 numbers. I think we can all agree that inflation is now at a 50 year high and the numbers of September 2021 no longer apply. So we have a long way to go. We still have 7,300 sites in the program that are either active or waiting. Um, we need closures, we need remedial construction, we need expenditures, and it's time to start climbing that mountain again. Um, but I'm here to say that miracles happen, and this is the sister of the donor listening to her brother's heart. I'm here to tell you that amazing things can happen when you persevere, when you don't give up, and as an industry, we are not going to give up. We are going to clean up the groundwater. We're going to close these 7,300 sites. And if we have to use the power of miracles and the power of strength and the power of commitment to do it, we're here to do that. I'm here to continue leading. I'm not going anywhere. I'm excited to continue to lead these industry associations. And we are going to get things done. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Natasha and hear how things are going in Tallahassee. Thank you, Natasha. Can you guys hear me back there? Now? Okay, I'm going to assume you can if I haven't heard any no's. So um, my name's Natasha Lampkin. I think you've heard that. Hopefully I've met many of you. Do we have a way to turn the volume up? It's not really, it's not really staying up very well. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay, so um, I've been in the Petroleum Restoration Program since 1994. I've worked about half the time um, for DEP and about half the time private. And I think we've come a long way in this program, especially recently over the recent years. I think we'll cover a lot of information. <laughs> that we're gonna cover a lot of information of what we've been doing recently, where we've come through the pause after COVID. I think we've all struggled through that. Um, and, and where we're at now, we'll talk a little bit about the federal funds and what we're doing to get those ready to utilize. And hopefully, let's just move forward and talk about the program. So we have four state teams in Tallahassee. Um, team one is managed by Mr. Matt Ingham, our professional engineer team leader. He covers, uh, you know, in addition to site management, um, he does all the advanced cleanup that we'll speak about later. Um, he does performance-based cleanup, if you guys have any questions on that, and he does a difficult site review. When, when we're struggling with technologies with, with, that are difficult to clean up, um, he coordinates some discussions and meetings on those and brainstorms. We also have with us um, Mr. James Treadwell, our, our chief PE, and he will be talking later also. Now, team two is our site access team, they do our forensics contracts, um, and they oversee the Petroleum Cleanup Participation Program. And that's, that's managed by our professional PG, Mr. Kim Busen. Then we have team three, which is the local programs and private teams. The majority of our site management is handled under this team through contracts, staff augmentation through counties, um, private teams, and DOH. We have two private teams. We have 12 local programs, and they do program cleanup in 41 counties and non-program in 20 counties. And then we do, they do enforcement under these contracts in four counties. So in addition to that, the program has taken on quite a bit more non-program work. Um, 
outside of the local programs. We're managing well over 1,000 non-program sites now. I believe the majority of the non-program site management would be under PRP. Um, anything in the Northeast and Northwest District, for the most part, that's a high score over 60, um, Tallahassee is now doing. So you, so you may get to work with us, um, you know, not just as an ATC, but on non-program sites, as well as under forensics or LSSI. Then we have team for our agency term contracts and program metrics. And this needs to be updated because we also do our SURFA negotiations out of here. That's managed by Mr. Blake Miller. We have 131 agency term contracts and 62 contractors there. But with Blake um, also doing program metrics, um, keeping up with all the data that you saw Mr. Hilfiker use for his requests and, and letters, supplying that, putting it out on the website. Every one of you guys have access to that on our website if you'd like to take a look at it. And we're always available to you to discuss any questions you have. So the um, agency term contracts and the program metrics, SERFA and eligibility. One thing we've been doing now for a little while that I'm not sure how much everyone's aware of that is we also, with eligibility, there's about, there were about 300 sites that fall in that range that really didn't submit an application for PCPP, but based on the time frame, they, we're looking at those to see if they possibly could move into a program, such as PCPP, or if, if, even if they haven't submitted the application, perhaps we can work with them on a program, and we've been doing that outreach and research. It started with about 300 sites, and we're about a third through that. So that's where you're seeing the increase in eligibilities. So talk a little bit about program metrics. Eligible discharge closures. So if you look at these peaks, they're really gonna show you when we put in um, assessment um, activities. When we had, in, you know, SCS, y'all might remember that, site characterization, screening. When we pulled in LSSI, um, when we moved to LSA, those types of things result very shortly after closures um, because we have a lot of older discharges which may have attenuated prior to us getting to them. But we also um, had those assessments when every one of us have seen the um, DRFs from the late 80s that say unknown. And, and with it being an amnesty program, I think we did get a lot of discharges. So through our efforts and assessment, we've pretty much handled those and, and done some type of preliminary assessment. We'll, we'll show some numbers on that later, but pretty much the eligible discharges have had some type of assessment. So this will result in us experiencing fewer closures at higher costs. So we're gonna see that. We're gonna see because it, it costs more to move into remediation than it does to assess a site and say, hey, this is clean when you also have to remediate it to get there. So that's something that the program's trying to message and make sure everyone's aware of. You're also gonna take longer if you have to implement some type of remediation strategy and the monitoring than if you close it after assessment. So that's, that is one of our challenges. And last year, I believe, I, I spoke to several people here about um, my goal to start looking at the 13 to 1400 sites we had in NAMP and to see if we couldn't get those moving forward um, and, and what we wanted to do about those sites if they had not attenuated at that point. Because not many new, new discharges are eligible. So these are things that have been here. So that, that's one of the things that um, we've been working on. And as, as I said, I think Matt and James are gonna talk about that quite a bit. We've implemented a lot of documents, guidance on that that's about to come out. So status of assessments, I mentioned earlier how many assessments we've been doing. So if you look at this, out of the open eligible discharges, over 7,000 of them have had some type of initial assessment. 64 of them, and this is the end of September. I should share that all of the data on here is from the end of September, so the first quarter. This is first quarterly data. 64 of these are currently undergoing some type of initial assessment. Now, some of these other ones might still be an assessment, but they've already had at least one 
um, type of assessment. Rather, it was LSSI and then it waited for further assessment, that type of thing. So we, we do have 3% um, or about 242 that need some type of initial assessment. What this graph interprets or, or how I interpret this graph is, okay, on those 7,000 sites, it's pretty obvious they're probably not going to close after assessment. So I, I, that's where we need to be prepared to move into, how we're going to address these sites. That, I mean, and, and it's not, it, there will be those that when we go back and reassess them, there should be a few. But for the most part, this is showing the growth of our program from assessment into remediation. So talking about the cleanup status of eligible discharges, this is something also that's impressive. If you go back and you look at where we were 10 years ago compared to where we're at now, eight years ago. Um, I mean, it's a big difference. But what I want to show you is 62% of our eligible discharges have been closed. We're working o over. We are currently managing over 25%, over a quarter of the eligible discharges in the state of Florida are currently being managed by industry and by the department. These are eligible. That's in addition to the non-program that industry's working on, that the department's working on. So I, I kind of want you to realize how fast we're moving. And it's pretty impressive if you look at what's going on there. So this is site access. And, and some of you guys may remember the struggle with site access. It's real. Um, we, we struggle with it all the time. Right now, we need, you know, what is that, 724 sites we're trying to get site access on. Only 204 of those are in funding range. Something the department does and, and is we pursue access, whether it's in funding range or not. But then we do also, some of these fall back into needing access when you have a new owner. So that, that number is constantly changing as we have to request new access. But we are, we are taking on the site access. You'll see that number's jumped up a little bit because with us lowering the score, there's more in the funding range. And we'll talk about the score shortly. So here, here's where we were when we first started with our agency term contracts. And our, we were given goals to get that 60 days down, and we've done that. And, and we've done that through many process improvements, metrics, tracking, training, guidance documents, um, consolidating work, organizing that. And we are still, and if you notice, I, I just want you to see the 2022-2023 data has an asterisk throughout because that's really the first quarter. I don't want anybody to ever think that this is the year because it, it really is the first quarter this data, but one of the things that you guys are probably aware of and that, that we'll run into is as we move into more source removals and more different types of remediation, you know, I, I'm going to say systems, but injections, everything, some of those take longer to get the quotes, some of those take longer um, to write the scope, to get the work out. And so, Watching that number closely, we're going to continue to monitor it um, and see where that goes. But our goal is to keep it there and, and to work on different things to get there. One of the things that we implemented today, um, as of today, and this is from feedback, you know, like, like um, Steve said, that, you know, we meet periodically, but we're available to each and every one of you. If you have thoughts, concerns, ideas, um, reach out to us. You know, our information's on the website. Um, you can talk to us about your concerns, your ideas, how things are going with you. We're, we're here for you. Um, absolutely. All of you are our stakeholders. We're working with you. So anything you want to discuss with us, please do. But one of the things we've implemented, like, like he said, based on the feedback and the information provided, we were able to, under the agency term contracts, implement in addition to the option to request 5% last year, we also were able to allow them to request up to 10%. Now, everyone didn't do this. There, were, there was a myriad of, some people still took reductions. So, um, but 
due to inflation, there were options for people to ask for increases. Um, and, and that's something we partner with and looked at. And if we can understand what we need to keep the program moving forward and we're able to do it, um, let's talk about it. Um, I, I just wanted to point out where we're at on turnaround time, and that was a challenge with the change to Ariba. As all of you know, we closed out every single project we had between, and, and you see how many sites we have going. Um, we Over 5,000 now, I think. We had to close every single project we had in, that had a contract issued on it and reissue it under um, Ariba On Demand over the past few months. And that's why you're seeing the net difference. Every single thing had to be canceled and rewritten. And we've done that for the four or 5,000 sites that we have active. We have handled that. So that, that's something, and keeping those numbers down for the turnaround time, I'm, I'm with that additional workload, I, I'm very happy that we were able to do that and keep the work going on all the sites. So what I was talking about earlier is the change order process um, and the three quote process. So we do have a three quote process. It's pretty standard throughout the state of Florida. It's very common, $2,500 or more, well, greater than $2,500, we get three quotes. And I think we all have seen changes with availability for certain things since COVID. I think we've all heard supply chain. I'm going to try not to say that too much, but we've heard some concerns, especially as we move into remediation. Um, electrical subcontractors, I think, has been a challenge that's been brought to the department. And, and that's something that we worked on. We worked closely we, with what contractual law, the statutes, the rules. We worked with our gatekeepers who, is, who, who approve things, our leadership. And, and we worked with our attorneys on what we could do to address that. I don't have it in here. It was implemented within the past hour. So I, I don't really have it, but I will talk about it a little bit. I do have notes on it. But it really is allowing us, it's laying out, we have always, if you show adequate, which is asking for three and documenting three qualified contractors to provide a service and you are able to provide only two quotes and a no bid, we have moved forward with that as a program. Um, that's not explicitly said in the contract, but there is contractual language in there that does say wherever possible, which allows us a little bit of leniency. Um, and so what we have done is we've also laid out what, with the statutes and the attorneys and, and the gatekeepers, what would be considered documentation adequate to move forward with one quote. In the rare case that we can't get two or three quotes, um, the department is required to do competitive quoting here. And, and the documentation is key. Um, and backing that up and submitting it. And um, if you're under these contracts, your contract managers have received this guidance today, as have our side. So this is something we've also put in place to help us with, specifically as we're trying to move into remediation, if we can't get those projects going, and, and you can't get those projects going, and you bring them to us, we may not be able to implement the solution that you bring, but we can definitely work through what we can do under the statutes and the contract and the rules and come up with a solution that hopefully will work for everyone. So purchase orders issued by fiscal year. And I appreciate Steve giving this little shout out there for the number of purchase orders we're issuing. So if you look at 21-22, I'm, I'm just going to kind of talk through the production here. And this 4,404 is not a real number. If you see, it's an extrapolated number for the whole year because I didn't want you to, to look at the 1,101 and think, wow, we're doing bad this year because that's, as I said, the first quarter. So I, I just want to show you if we continue to implement purchase orders at that rate where we would be. We're issuing more work than ever. The, in addition to that 1,101, as I said, other than the 489 DPUs that were transferred over that we had to manually upload the attachments, we also um, did that 1,101. So keep in mind that all that additional work we did there included all the transition work we did also. 
which was, in addition to issuing new purchase orders, we had to redo the DPUs, we had to close out all the other invoices, and industry did a great job on getting their deliverables in, getting their invoices in, and I appreciate that, because I don't know where we would have been. And this was another challenge thrown at all of us, just like, you know, the pause was. And I think we rose to meet that challenge, and I'm, I'm very happy we did. I know it was a daunting idea when we heard that was going away. So I, I just wanted to talk to you about the extrapolated number and show you with the production where we're at. We are seeing decreases um, in the net than from last year. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit and why we are, but okay. So as I said, that these numbers are historical, and as you see, um, 15 million was our net, and that's the same number I believe that Steve put up. Um, I do have some notes that, you know, at the end of October where we were, but it was 20 million, and that's not a surprise. That's, that's um, a challenge, and, and what that's showing you is we're putting out more purchase orders than we ever did, so why is our net so low? So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, and this is the numbers from the end of October. Um, our, our actual issued new work was $44 million. That's not counting the um, DPUs that went out. That's, that's, that's just new work issued was $44 million. That's not, that's not $31 million for the DPUs. Um, that, and then, so if you look at that $44 million and that $31 million, that is $75 million that went out the first quarter, new work out the door. What you're seeing reductions in, so this is a net number. What you're seeing reductions in is, that would be what you guys got new POs for, purchase orders to do work. What you're seeing reductions is every single thing we had to cancel in legacy. You had the final invoice, when you final invoice, as you know, there's the reduction amount. Those all go away. And so we don't normally have that. If you notice during the pause, we shortened scopes to save money to keep sites going, where we went down to two quarters of O&M and stuff like that, to, or you know, to keep things going. That's that is the same thing that we that kind of this change did to the program is it shortened all of those scopes to end on June 30th, and at that point, all of that money got reverted back, and then we have to re-encumber it and send it out with new POs. So. I want you to be aware that that is what we're seeing with the net changes. We're also seeing, as we said, we allowed um, up to 15% request for um, rate increases last year. Um, industry was struggling and reached out to us about you know, the normal process, and as the amendment says, that goes into effect when you get your new purchase order. Some of these purchase orders were longer, and they've asked for us to help out with that. And so what we've done is said, if the purchase order goes past a certain date, we can go ahead and unencumber that and issue a new purchase order with your new rates. That means all that money is a net reduction, and then we got to re-encumber it. Additional work, and it's going to show in the numbers that you're taking that money away and you're putting it back. So those two things us allowing reductions to um, reissue with the new rates and us having to move the work has really shown a net problem, but I want you to not, I mean, I know we do, our goal is to, of course, look at what we've been authorized to work under and utilize those funds to address contamination. That, that is what we're here for, so that is definitely what we're striving for. What I want you to understand is at the end of October, that was the end of invoicing under, that was the end of all of that under legacy. That's gone. November's where you're gonna see the change. So we're, we're done with that. You, you can't do that anymore because the database is shut down. Those, every single one of those were closed. I think there, we have one or two that did not get their information, POs out of the thousands we had that did not get their information into invoice before that deadline. So this, this time period up through the end of October, and we started seeing the last week or two of October 
a big change in encumbrances. And so not, you know, not encumbrances, but let me rephrase that, net encumbrances, where when you you know, when you saw, if you go look at the weekly list, you're gonna see back during this time frame, maybe we encumbered 3 million, and then maybe we unencumbered 2.8 million with change order reductions if you look at that line. So even though we're continuing to issue work, and you should have plenty of work out there, it does look daunting here if you don't understand the pattern and see how this is going to change. It's still, it's still a, a big goal to come from, you know, 41 million to 198 million. For you guys to ramp up, for us to ramp up, you know, I know our local programs have been hiring, our private teams have been hiring, we've been training. So, so I, I think it is a big swing to go from there and that's, that's our goal and that's what we're working towards. So program progress and growth. So these are a few things that we're, we're kind of working on up there. As you know, I'm talking about a transition assessment to remediation. I can't say that enough because I really want everyone to understand what that means to the program. For time frames to close a site, for costs to close a site, for the closure numbers. That's, that's one of the other reasons we're pulling in so many of these NAMs to make sure they're going to close. You know, if these are our new, let's get them off the table so we can pull in more sites and manage those. Let, let's keep them moving. So I, I think I've talked about this, but it is, it is important. It's one of the things I really want to convey here is discharges that met cleanup criteria after assessment have pretty much been closed. I mean, you saw there's only a few hundred we haven't done some type of assessment on. So the remaining discharges we expect are going to need some type of enhancement to close them. And, you know, long-term monitoring is an option, and I know that, you know, Matt and James are going to talk quite a bit about that. Remediation is an option. I mean, if the site needs remediation, we're ready to move into that. Um, the other thing the program has implemented, and I'm going to give a shout-out to Broward County, because they've been doing this um, themselves, but we started an institutional engineering controls inspection program. Under eligible sites, we didn't have as many conditional closures before, but now we do. We've got the conditional closure agreement. As sites are needing remediation, they hit their caps, and, and the conditional closure endpoint is more attractive to some owners. So we've, you know, every five years, you'll start seeing these inspections um, on-site institutional and engineering. You'll, we, We'll be identifying engineering controls that need to be repaired um, or if there's concerns with them. And so you may start seeing some of these come around. So the other thing that we're doing, and it's in beta testing right now. I'm not sure when it will finally be rolled out, but we're testing it. I think many of our contractors submit their electronic data deliverables through our electronic submittal portal. You upload your lab EDDs. You will start uploading all of your deliverables for the department. Um, instead of emailing them to a site manager that may be out, um, when this rolls out, you will, just like you submit your EDD, you'll go out there, you'll pick your site, you'll pick your deliverable, you'll pick your purchase order, or if it's non-program, you don't pick a purchase order, you pick non-program. You will upload that report, and I don't think there's the size concerns, we'll, we'll have to work through that, that there are with some of the emails. And that report will do, several, that you submitting that, it will notify the site manager that it's in there for review. It will put it into Oculus, well, I believe they said three days. It will show an Oculus in three days. Um, it will send a link where you can see it um, and access it. It will, update our stickum, the, the, our database. Um, and that's important because we use that for metrics, not just for you guys, but every single one of our site managers, every single one of our teams in the program is metricized with deliverable turnaround rates. How fast are they reviewing that deliverable? This actually puts the date we received it in and sets it with them as pending for our metrics. So I'm just letting you know, we, we do metricize everything, and this is one step in taking some of the administrative burden off of everyone for sending these back and forth, 
and allowing the site managers to focus on reviewing the reports or issuing the purchase order or discussing the scopes. So this is something that I'm excited. We've been pushing for this for a while. So I'll, I'll have more on that, I'm sure, next year um, once it gets implemented and we'll have some lessons learned. So the other thing that I'm extremely proud of, we are at a score lower than we have ever been at before, even after the pause. We have resumed from there to halfway through score of 10, maybe more than halfway, actually. If you look at that, we are, like I said, we're managing over 25% of the ever eligible discharges in the state of Florida are currently being managed. We lowered the score and pulled in 475 discharges right near the beginning of this fiscal year. And then we recently lowered the score again and pulled in 600 additional discharges. Like I said, we've been ramping up. The counties have been ramping up. Um, we've been moving. Um, so those sites that you saw needing assessment, I mean, I'm sorry, needing access, that's a result of pulling in over 1,000. We've got 200 left that need site access. We've been working on that. When, and I get a lot of questions about this. The statute tells us how we lower the score if we split a score. I think the score of 10 has almost 2,000 discharges. So that's, that's, you know, as we process those, we, we um, split those, and the statute tells us we do it based on the eligibility order. I get a lot of misunderstanding there thinking it's the discharge day. It is the eligibility order. What we also do here is if you have any discharge at that site that meets that criteria, with a discharge date, I mean, I'm sorry, an eligibility order date of 1995 or before, all of the discharges at that site start. So even if some of the other discharges had later eligibility orders, they're all pulled in based on that date. Because it doesn't make sense to work on one out of three. So. So it really does pull in more than this number of discharges. Uh, I'm just letting you know, but this is what we pulled in in less than the past, so the past nine months, I think. We got back to where we were before and then pulled in this many more. So um, I kind of, before I talk about advanced cleanup, I think I, I want to talk a little bit about ARPA. So that's the federal funds. That, that's something else we're working on. Um, the federal funds, we're gonna be under the treasury category of infrastructure, which is, as you saw right here, I talk about that the money for this year, um, that includes 50 million. So it's 198, but that's 148, and then 50 million from federal funding. That 50 million requires additional information in your purchase orders. It requires additional, you have to have a UEI number. It, it requires a, a lot of different things and additional reporting. What we've been working on recently, when we were pulled into what's gonna happen with the ARPA funding and the reporting, We've been working on a way that the department could do that reporting instead of having it in the purchase order for the contractors. We were given um, standard attachments, but we are working through that. And so our reporting people, you know, on Blake's team that normally do the dashboard and stuff, they've really been focusing on getting this so that we can move into the ARPA. And, and so that we're hoping that the department can take on the brunt of the federal reporting. That That is our our goal there. So um, we were going to talk about PBC, but I, I do want to add something else. As we moved from legacy into a rebound demand, um, July 1st, a rebound demand does not have an e-quote process. It has a collaborative quoting process that will be available to us starting in January. So we are working on some e-quotes, and I think you guys will be happy to hear. The current estimate that we hope to be able to put, we'll see how Ariba rolls out in January, how we're able to access that and put these quotes out. 
but it appears to be, and as you know, when we get the quotes back, we do save money on e-quotes, but the current amount of those e-quotes that we have preparing and process to put in an offer is $9 million. So that's gonna be a lot of fun in January for all of us. I'm excited about some of those big projects um, and we'll get those going. So what I wanna say to you is I believe that the contract section sent you out something talking about your commodity code and Ariba on demand. It is our understanding that if you don't have the correct commodity code that we sent out, you will not get to participate in these. When it sends it out, it will not include you, even if you're on the list. So you do still have a little bit of time to make sure you get that updated. We can't see your side. I can't, I can't walk you through it. We don't have access to your information and how the screens you see, um, but we'll support you in any way we can on there. I know that a list went out letting you know about the commodity code. We, we discovered this issue with some of the registrations with some of our contractors when we were looking at our ARPA reporting plan where we were gonna do some of this for you guys. And so that's when we, we figured out that it doesn't appear these are correct. So anything we do that you want to participate on, if you don't have that commodity code, the way it's explained to us is you will not be able to participate. So this is a, I know we've emailed you but this is a very good opportunity to let you know that this is super important. Um, at this point, it's, it's probably critical if you want to participate in these e-quotes. Um, so I, I just wanted to go kind of share that a little bit. I had a reminder to bring that up during advanced cleanup because we get to talk a little bit about PBC here, and that's, that's what reminded me. So, um, so advanced cleanup has funding up to $30 million. We currently have an application period ongoing. It's open right now. You can apply to be in advanced cleanup. Submit your sites. Of course, it has the 25% cost share cost savings. And what's new to many of us and many of you guys is that now under statute, we, the department, do the LCAR for the advanced cleanup. So there's not as much front work for the application on your side. So, um, you know, if you hadn't planned before, you'd have to plan quite a bit before we had a, pa um, a period open. But now you, you can do that a little quicker, I think. I think it turns it around faster on you and, and pulls it in. So these are just some metrics. I think it, we go through this every year in one way or the other. What we've been doing in advanced cleanup since 2014, you know, if you look at that, to sum up, we've got, what is that, two, 270 sites that have done advanced cleanup and it saved the department based on the cost savings or the um, cost share, $27 million that we can use on other sites. So that's great. So the other thing that I'm very passionate about, I really like, because it, it, it's just visual, um, is the advanced cleanup redevelopment. I don't know if many of you remember the LSRI program where we did the excavation at the time of the tank upgrades. And we got that soil when we could get to it. And that was such a great reduction. So that when you come back, the site's closed. The site's clean. You know, you've got the source out. Maybe it's had that year or two when it comes back in funding range where we can monitor it and close it or assess it and close it. So advanced cleanup redevelopment, I, I see kind of like that. We don't have to have a cost share. We don't have to have a cost savings. We've done 26 of these for $16 million. And it really is for a site being redeveloped. It's, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's a fast moving project because we work with you to get the closure option that works for your owner and work on under the time frame for their redevelopment. So this is anybody that's talking about, and there's no score limit. There's no cost share, no score limit. I'm redeveloping. We get $5 million a year out of that $30 million. Goes up to $5 million out of that up to 30 million can go towards ACR. Historically, we've run out of money every year. I don't know about, well, not during the pause because we didn't have the funding to do it, but we've, we, other than that, we use it. And so I want you to think about, for your owners, I know I have people calling me, asking me all the time, what can I do out here? I know you're working, you've got 
these wells, and I always point them towards Matt and ACR. I do. I sent them. I said, we got a great idea for you because we might not get to it later. It, by get to it, I mean access it. This is a little more summary on, you know, what you do and don't do under advanced cleanup. If you need the LCAR, if you don't, under ACR, you do need an LCAR. You come in with a plan to meet the closure goals in the time frame and have the documentation of the redevelopment so that we're ready to go. And that's a pretty fast moving one. So this is an example. This is visual. This is great. Many people will see this um, and say, I've seen that picture before. Yes, it's one we're showing a lot. I do have another one planned um, to be finished very soon. I'm excited to be able to show that picture in the future. But if you look at this, where we did this, where we did this excavation out here, um, if you look at that work, and then you look at the building on that same block, there's no way we would have been able to get to that contamination after that was built. And so that's such a difficult challenge we all deal with, is trying to remediate sites when access is limited. I mean, the structures are in the way. And this program is specifically designed to prevent that, um, to let us get in there and address it. So I want you to think about that every time your owner talks to you about trying to build on their property. I think that program is well, well worth looking into. Okay, I was asked to talk a little bit about PFOS. So PFOS is another program, or under another program in the Division of Waste Management, which is where I work. So PFOS is under Waste Cleanup, Ms. Jim Farrell, and I will have her contact information up here, but I'm just mentioning briefly what Florida's got going on with PFOS. This is, I was just asked to give a brief update, so I'm just gonna let you know that the Florida statutes, right now we don't have standards established formally, um, but it says right now if we don't have standards established, um, cleanup target levels established by 1-125, DEP must adopt cleanup target levels for drinking water, groundwater, and soil but these levels then must be ratified by the Florida legislature. So I think that's important. It also says that government entities and private water suppliers are not subject to administrative or judicial action to compel site rehabilitation and payment of fines or penalties. They're not subject to that, those entities, and that's in the statute now. The other thing I wanna say is that, you know, this additional information if you Google either one of those, we have a dynamic plan out on the website. We actually have a website, our efforts to address, address PFOS and the environment. So these are, there, there's a lot of information on the webpage for this. And I just was gonna run through, and like I said, this data is all from September, so please understand if maybe one or two of these numbers has changed since then. But this is just giving you an idea of ratios of, um, what our provisional levels are set. We don't have levels, as you saw in the previous screen, but this is what we're seeing when we're doing assessments. So I can run through those. Um, so 25 out of the 28 fire training facilities had exceedances. Um, 32 out of 46 dry cleaning sites. Um, so state funded cleanup sites, 14 out of 29. Federal program section, 18 bases had exceedances. Um, so CERCLA, we had three out of three sites that had exceedances, and we've asked DEP to sample, uh, DEP has asked EPA to sample 15 sites under Superfund. And that, like I said, that may have progressed since September. Um, and I was also asked to give a brief update on the dry cleaning solvent program. So this again is in the Division of Waste Management this is managed under the Waste Cleanup Program under Jim Farrell um, and so the Dry Cleaning Solvent Program has 10 contracts for contractors. They have a $20 million budget this fiscal year. Their goal is to complete site assessment activities on 100 new sites by the end of the fiscal year and that means complete the site assessment 
to the level that a remedy can be selected. So as you see, we've pulled in, not only have we resumed work on that number of sites, we just pulled in a thousand more sites that we're also trying to assess. So keep in mind, even if we did some type of assessment, usually when you go back and park a site, there's gonna be some assessment going on. So we're pretty sure they're probably not gonna close after assessment, but we are probably gonna to return to the assessment phase. So keep in mind that this is a lot of people in the division of waste working with a lot of people of industry to do a lot of assessment. And I think we're seeing some challenges with our resources there. And I think everybody's experiencing it. And this is part of it. They got additional funding and, and they set these goals um, to utilize that, as we all do when we get funding. We, we all want to use lives, our funding. We've got sites out there we want to clean up, we want to assess, we want to plan a remedy on. But that's some of what you're seeing is that um, some of the things, you know, drilling, labs, all that type of stuff, they're going to be using the similar drillers, labs, and everything. So that, that's another pull on our resources. So that their other goals are to continue funding sites with existing remedies, which would be monit monitoring or O&M, and then their goal is to close 26 sites this fiscal year. I just kind of wanted to give you a brief update there, but I want to share Jim Farrell is the program administrator for the Waste Cleanup Program and the Division of Waste Management. She's my counterpart there. Aaron Cohen, he is the manager for the Dry Cleaning Solvent Program. So he is the one, and their information is available on here with any questions that you might have. Thank you. And that would be my information. And again, I, wanna, I want to you know, conclude that that's how you can reach me, but I am available for anything that ideas, thoughts, concerns. <laughs>